Welcome to our backyard. This is the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We are two friends having a discussion after everyone else has passed out or gone to bed. Grab a drink and listen as we discuss everything from automation, space exploration, and why the meaning of life is 42. Nick, let me ask you a question. Have you or someone you know done something so ridiculous that people simply just don't believe you? That what you did was impossible and they're simply just making it up, but then you later on find out their story was actually true? Yes. Not very often, though. But also, yes, because I'm a fisherman, so obviously everything I say is true. Well, people have been telling tall tales for eons. Most are myth and fiction, but sometimes the unbelievable is in fact the truth. In today's episode, I will tell you of an explorer that ventured far and wrote down his journey. But before I get into this adventure, Nick, how are you and what are you drinking? I'm doing great. I'm drinking a Coors Light and uh, ready to hear whatever you got cooking. How about yourself? What are you drinking? Well, I'm just drinking some water because it's the middle of the afternoon for me and I still got stuff to do. Oh, it's the middle of morning for me, but I'm not working, so one in Rome. Well... We're not going to Rome. We're actually traveling back to ancient Greece. So when adjacent to Rome, ish. (laughs) Well, it's a little more complicated than that because it's ancient Greece, not in Greece. It's a time when the world was so big and still unfathomable. A time when a man, a merchant, became restless and sailed into the horizon. This man would be Pythias. Pythias, not exactly being Greek. He was born in Marcel, France which at the time was a Greek colony. So therefore, by logic, he is technically a Greek because he's born in the Greek colony. Sure, that's a stretch, but history has him down as a Greek. Born around sometime between 350 BC or 330 BC, depending on your source. So plus or minus a decade. Little is known about his youth, but being a sea merchant in a flourishing trading area, one could assume he was born into it. And apparently, by the time he reached adulthood, he was considered a skilled navigator and a skilled sailor. Being a merchant, I have to imagine, somewhat educated on where certain goods come from, what the rates are, are, he started to become curious. Curious about a certain material important to the life in the Mediterranean. Tin. Tin used in a slew of materials, from diningware to tools. Tin, at this point in history, was super important. And still important somewhat today. And hearing or wondering where tin comes from. He would later learn or discover that a large portion, it comes from a place, a mythical place that no Greek has been to, that place being England. England to the Greeks were only known by word of mouth. None has yet to see it with their own eyes. And Pythias, whether it be his sense of exploration, wanting to know, or simply wanting to scratch that itch of figuring out what's out there in the big world, he would set sail to find out. He would be leaving around the age of 25, somewhere around that point, so 325 BC, somewhere somewhere around there. And he would leave his home and set sail, but again, the exact time is lost throughout the ages. His travels on how he got to his, his unique destination are only speculations. For the book he wrote, Perito Okonom, On the Ocean, has been lost through time. One possible wrote, One possible route he took was through the Pillars of Hercules, better known as today as the Strait of Gibraltar, which would have been a dangerous path, for this path was controlled by the Carthaginians and was blocked for control. And Carthage, being in and out of wars with multiple nations like Syracuse, probably didn't help that region be safe. But it is a possibility he set sail through the Strait of Gibraltar. The other possibility route he took was he sailed on the coast, and then when he came close to the strait, he traveled inland perhaps even over land, uh, simply to go around the blockade, and historians think it actually might have been cheaper for him to do this rather than to keep sailing all the way around. So usually the cheaper option tends to be the option people take, so I feel like this one has more merit. Either way, <clears throat> either way, he somehow made it to the port of Corbulo, a port located at the river of Lori R- River in France. From there, he followed the coast and traveled north, using the stars to help navigate writing about the swelling and large waves he encountered in the Atlantic Ocean. Now, like I said, his writings might have been lost, but other people's writings on his adventures, on his writings, still exist, which I'll come back to later on. Pushing forward into unknown waters, into a time, 
people thought you could sail off the edge of the world, he continued onward. Days, weeks, months, he traveled till he reached his destination, the island of Britannia. From there he explored, visiting the tin mines, writing down the flora and the sights, landscape he saw, the different methods, pulling tin out of the ground. He is said to have sailed and walked the entire perimeter of England, and in his travels started to calculate and try to figure out how far away from home he was. Through his years of navigation, star mapping, and travel, he figured out that he was 1,050 miles away from Marcel, his home. And boy, was he close. He was actually 1,120 miles away from his home. Not bad for a merchant who probably didn't have higher form of education. Only, only, only about 100 miles off? That's not bad at all. But he was not done there. Either before traveling or on his travels, he heard of a mythical place, a place that harbored giants, which the Greeks called the Hyperboreans, a place known as Thule. The exact land which is Thule is not known. Could have been as close as Scotland, as far as Iceland, the Norwegian coast, or some have speculated North America. From the research I've done, I highly doubt it's North America based on the surviving information. My best guess, it's either Iceland or Norwegian coast, but the... The itch to explore kept, kept bugging him, so he pushed onward, went north to find the land of Thul, the land of giants, and he would find them and write about their tall heights. Then he would travel to the Baltic Sea, and Nick, I think you'll appreciate this, he'd even travel to the Arctic Circle. Being a Greek merchant in the Mediterranean Sea in the time where the fastest mode of transportation was either by boat or by horseback, he traveled to the Arctic Circle. I mean... I get it though, right? Like you're trying to, you're going to, ch you're setting out to go to adventure to this magical place and then you come to England. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, maybe, maybe we keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but can you imagine living the era of 300 BC, seeing lands none of your countrymen had ever seen, could not describe or even imagine? Could you imagine, uh, trying to explain a tundra to a Mediterranean has to be extremely hard. And also, traveling all that way with the technology of the time, not knowing if a rogue wave or an angry local or which food was safe to eat, making each day could be the last day. God, that that must be an insane. Yeah, I can't even imagine. I mean, making it to the Arctic Circle, like, if you're not used to, if you grew up in the Mediterranean and had never seen ice and snow, I mean, I'm sure you probably heard stories, like, but yeah, that'd be... That'd be crazy. It's not like you can take a picture and, sh you know, show everyone. You can't bring it back. <laughs> I brought you back this ice. It's water now, but it was ice. But the lands and seas he traveled is not the only significance of his adventures. During his travels, he learned information that would help propel our world forward. He was the first to write about the midnight sun. For those wondering, the midnight sun is a phenomenon that happens in places like the Arctic Circle or Antarctica Circle where the sun is invisible at midnight. He was the first written recorded to discover that the North Star does not, draw, does not line up directly with the North Pole. And perhaps the most surprising to me, he is the first recorded person to have written about the association with tides to the phases of the moon. His crazy adventures would take anywhere from eight months to three years. We simply have no idea. But on his adventure home, he decided to take something a little risky. Usually, if you venture into the Dangers usually come back the same way you came because the path you know is much safer. He did not want to do that. He took a different way home, going to explore the North Friskin Islands off the coast of Germany, along with other islands and lands next to it, sailing around the upper European coast to visit more lands, writing down his adventures the entire time, and finally making it back home. His writings would be published and used for a while, and being the only source for quite for centuries about the knowledge of subarctic regions and of Northwest Europe. You know, Nick, a lot of these people we talk about on this podcast, all the wonder, all the wondrous and inconceivable things they do, it really makes me wonder what the hell I'm doing with my life. I know, I just did a, a nine-hour car ride, you know, through snowy mountains and rain. I'm like, man, that was tough. I'm like, oh, no, it wasn't. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Well, at this time, when he published, many philosophers, scientists, mathematicians, and explorers would read his writings. Apparently, some of his writings were even in the Library of Alexandria, and a lot of these people who read their, his writings simply just didn't believe Pythias, thinking that he made it up, 
and that the things he saw, like tall waves in the Atlantic Ocean, were simply not possible. For reference, the Mediterranean compared to the Atlantic Ocean has very calm waves. Oh yeah, so I, I've been to the Mediterranean and I live on the Pacific. In our calm waves, like stuff you would take a kayak out there, they're like, what is this madness? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a world of difference. Uh, and for reference on how they didn't believe him, a philosopher named Strabo called Pythias, and I quote, the worst possible liar, end quote. But we should be happy for these cynics and naysayers, for their ridicule of the adventures and quoting Pythias' book as reference as lies and conceivable or in their own writings is all we have left of his tale. His writings would spread, but over time fade and be lost forever. Pythias himself would die somewhere around 300 to 285 BC. Not quite sure on the date. And again, all we have for reference are quotes and ridicules of his book, On the Ocean. The stories he must have had, the eye-opening experiences he must have felt, one could only imagine. Being a man who never knew the sun could be up at midnight, to see a frozen tundra, visit a land where giants lived, and by giants, these were just Northern European people who just happened to be taller than the average person at the day. To make that, to see all that and make it back, it is a shame his writings are lost. But I believe his story to be an inspirational one. A tale to convince us to travel and view the impossible, but to also write and save the written word so others in different time may benefit. But now you know of Pythias, the French Greek who dared to sail north and made it back. Nick, that's the tale. What do you think? I'd say that's one of the most insane stories I've never heard of. Just a, I, man, this is a little off topic, but imagine all the tales we can't even hear of because all the books were burned in the Library of Alexandria or lost. How many other adventures that we just never knew of? Ugh, disheartening. But at least one, his uh, stories survive through quotations and being ridiculed. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Backyard Philosophy Podcast. We rarely finish a podcast without missing a point we wanted to bring up, so let us know what we forgot. And if you have a topic you want us to talk about, let us know at Backyard Philosophy on Instagram and Backyard Philosophy Podcast on Facebook.